Oh yeah, no, I was going to introduce myself with Dan and mess with them. Okay, that's fine. Nice. Do my stuff. Okay, so should we intro ourselves? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm Flint Dilly. I'm uh, it, back in the day. I'm a G1 guy. I've had like <laughs> the two or three moments for uh, of uh, life in Transformers, and in G1 uh, I came on at the like as a as an associate producer. I've been a story editor on GI Joe. Uh, in like mid season one, not early mid, and uh, was on really until mid season three. Uh, I wrote the miniseries from the beginning of season three, and then sort of plotted out the episodes and kind of helped them deal with the Optimus Prime problem, and, uh, and then, then snuck off to humanoids and visionaries, you know, and like pretended I'd never heard of Transform. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so I did that, and then uh, came back to the game for G1. Uh, did a uh, then did a graphic novel series. I was thrilled to see people had uh, guy named Chris Metzen, who is the uh, creative lead at Blizzard. You guys do Warcraft and Starcraft and Diablo. He and I wrote a uh, graphic novel. Actually, those three series. So those are my different uh, periods in Transformers, and uh, happy to answer anything you want to answer now. Thank you, uh, Flint. And uh, let's move on to Mr. Gilvezan. I'm Dan Gilvezan, and uh, I obviously perform the uh, voice of Bumblebee and uh, a few other. <laughs> Sorry, I was just. I, he promised not to mess with me, and he started already. <laughs> this goes back to a lot of experiences in, uh, you know, in recording studios and stuff like that. God, yes, I used to look in the in, through the glass because we were all in the in the room with the microphones. Flint was in with the rest of the producers, the writers, Wally Bird, the director, right. and they were constantly they were constantly. I'd see him in there, and they'd be like, "We do a line," and they'd be like. Yeah, that's good. They were saying, boy, he sucks. You know, we, we need to recast. Yeah, and, and hopefully they were just friends. No, it was usually me fighting with the producers because, like, the lines the voice actors would do were often a whole lot better than what we did. And so we'd hear something really good, and the producers really didn't want to change it because it sort of started a chain reaction of events. But when the actors are warm up, we'll, we'll finish your intro, we'll tell you that. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I did tons of animation uh, in the 80s. Uh, Spider-Man and his amazing friends as Spider-Man. Um, those, those are the, my two biggies. And uh, But we did a lot of, there were so many shows going on uh, at that point because every toy company uh, wanted a 65 episode series to back up their toy line. So it was a, it was a golden age for, for all of us, for the yep. writers, for the uh, performers. Uh, I did a show called Dino Riders, I did Sectars, I did uh, uh, Cooler and Pound Puppies for Hanna-Barbera. So just in lots and lots and lots of stuff like that. And uh, But, you know, the, obviously the Transformers and, and Spider-Man are, are closest to my heart. So um, that's a little bit about me, but let's get back to what? Uh, let's get back to those good old days. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and like you can treat us like interactive objects and just come on up and ask us questions. Yes. Yeah. We're here to talk about what you guys want to talk about now. I mean, we're really interested in what we want to talk about, but we're kind of here for we're a live act here. Yeah. This is a question for Flint. This is a, I guess, a, a particular question. You were the story consultant on Transformers the movie. I think you're gonna you have quite a few uh, interesting facts about that. How much were you just a consultant? How much were your were your basically your hands all over the movie? Uh, so just tying in the movie with what would come after that, season three. In season three, uh, there was a scene when Rodimus Prime, uh, it's supposed to be a death scene, turns out it's not, he went into the Matrix, and he said, my time in the light is short. R.C. says, that's what Optimus Prime said when he was dying. He, Optimus Prime in the final version of the movie did not say that. Is that line from one of the versions of the drafts? What a great question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, I was sitting here sweating for him the whole yeah, time. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm still sweating. Yeah, but, right. I, okay. Now, you have to remember, this is all 30 years ago, yeah. so yeah. I'm accessing this hard drive. It's like, you know, it's like a version 1.0, you know, 10 gig, 10 megabyte. It's not working too well. But uh, yeah, answer the first question. Yeah, I, basically my history on the, on the Transformer movie was... I was on. I was a, a co-producer, an associate producer. I can't remember what I was at that point. And I was a story editor and sometimes writer. But usually, I would write defensively if a script fell out. You know, we got a draft in that really 
we didn't think we could salvage. You know, I was not really around to write in the show. And um, because, I, you know, it's the story editor's job is, you know, we have a bunch of different writers writing a show. And the story editor's job is to make it all one show. No writer can know what we did in the five scripts before and the five scripts after it that somebody else wrote. So we try to, you know, make it all one cohesive whole or how we were playing certain characters. I mean, you know, the Bible for the show is like this thick and, you know, you, you can't ask anybody to internalize all that. And remember, the, sh the shows didn't mostly exist because we were busy making them so they couldn't tell them to go watch old episodes and we were always introducing new characters. Sorry, that's a really long explanation for... So what happened with the movie is I was blissfully una unaware of the movie. And long before I was at Sunbow, there was a guy named Ron Friedman, who I think wrote the G.I. Joe pilot and was, was contracted to Sunbow. To, and, and his agent put in the contract, it, that's, this is a good agent, by the way, that he would write any movies that came out of these shows. Now, remember, in you know, 1984, nobody was doing animated movies. You know, animation would hit the world like a hurricane five years later. But at that moment, you know, it was, this was incredibly disreputable. <laughs> you know, it, it, nobody was making animated movies. But Disney come out with one every 200 years, and then there'd be some like art damage stuff coming out of a foreign country in an art theater. But there, there weren't animated movies then, like there are now. And so nobody ever thought there'd be a movie. And so the first thing I heard about the movie, other than just vaguely knowing there was one, but like I never really believed they were going to make a movie out of Transformers. I just figured this was some you know, corporate hype or something. Yeah, I mean, it, to the extent that it even you know, hit my processors. Remember, we're trying to make 65 episodes of the show, and I'm pinch hitting and writing G.I. Joe episodes at this point. So I had no processing power left on the other side of my brain to know what was happening. This is a very long answer to the question, but it's a question I've asked a lot, and I just want to stabilize it. One day, Jay Bacall said, oh, we just got the first draft of the Transformer movie in. Uh, and I said, oh, <laughs> you know, that's interesting. And, you know, and he said, well, it needs some work, you know, and, and you know, I'm going to come out and let's, let's go over it, Joe and Tom, being Tom Griffin and Joe Bacall, or Joe Bacall and Tom Griffin, who headed up Griffin Bacall, the ad agency of which Sunbow was the company. Remember, they're Hasbro's ad agency, and so we're the production company. Um, it felt that, you know, just want us to, to get in and just figure out what we do with this. And so Jay comes out and one thing led to another and kind of at nobody's behest, we write an entirely new movie the following week. We used some of Ron's stuff and, and all that. Ron's stuff, there's brilliant stuff in there. It just didn't, and this is not Ron Friedman's fault. This is called being a writer in the entertainment business. Yeah, I've written incoherent scripts too. And that is you get so many notes from so many people and you're pressured to come up with the first draft by a certain day. So you take everybody's note and idea and you throw it in there and knowing that it doesn't make any sense. But you just put it in there so there's something to talk about. So there's no, there's no slur on Ron Friedman in this. But the, the script didn't, you know, wasn't a cohesive thing. And so we took it upon ourselves to write a script over the next week. So we wrote an entire movie in a week. You know, Jay was living on my couch, and you know, and and we sat there and wrote it. We were convinced this was the greatest script ever written by anybody for any reason. <laughs> um, and you know, like that Orson I'm Welles, sure it you know, was. if he came and did Unicron, he'd realize Citizen Kane was number two. Uh, and. Uh, um, you know, and it, however, you know, Joe and Tom didn't share our enthusiasm, uh, you know, when we got back. But nevertheless, there was the script called The Secret of Cybertron, which was our version of the Transformer movie, which continued to be more and more and more influential in the series. And frankly, a lot of the thinking of it became, you know, what was Five Faces of Darkness, which you could look at as sort of a second Transformers movie, except the animation kind of sagged. Uh, but, uh, um, so anyway, that script, nobody has a copy of it. I think there were the initial distribution was five people. It was you know, Jay and I and Joe and Tom and Roger Slifer. And, um, and maybe Carol Weitzman had a copy and Hildy Mesnick had a copy. And I keep hoping I'm going to find one in sort of my Ark of the Covenant storage box somewhere in my, in my thing, but I haven't. So, and then after that, we started what would become the Transformer movie. And that would go on over the next, I would put this somewhere around February of, I want to say, 
85 that we started this process because I think it was summer of 85. I could be lying to you, but I think it was summer of 85 that I was out in New York for I don't know, six weeks, right across the street from Sunbow in the, uh, and it's kind of, it makes it relevant to today, in the Grand Hyatt, which was Donald Trump's first hotel in New York. Um, you're rewriting the script, and then 20 other drafts came after that, and everybody had notes, and every, I mean, the, you know, the final script is not, you know, my work or Ron Friedman's work, it's a collaborative work of God knows how many people. It's just I was the guy that input it and tried to gel it all together. So for the uh, for that line, for that lost Optimus Prime line, then would you think it was something that was in the one of the many scripts? Yes, uh, my guess is I think you nailed it. I, here, okay. Now bear in mind, yes, there are many scripts, and then after that, there are many storyboards. Then there, and now animation is an extremely effective, you know, efficient medium. You don't go shoot a bunch of scenes. You don't shoot coverage. You don't have a master. Okay, you know, it's not like live action. You know, you're very efficient about it, but you still cut things up. You're over length, it doesn't make sense anymore, it's dragging the movie down. I mean, editorial is a very real part of the process. You figure, you write a script three times. You write the script when you write it, you write it when you're in production, then you rewrite it and edit it. You know, and that's so, yeah, I would imagine that line fell out, and at that point I was so dazed and unaware of it, I assumed it was still in and referenced it in the script. That's, how's that for a really long answer to your question? <laughs> Thank you, it was an awesome answer. Thank you. The thing, you know, I, I first got the uh, the, the script, um, and I was excited that we were going to do a movie because, you know, it was a very successful series, obviously, and um, so it's going to be expanded into a 90-minute movie, and it was going to be on the big screen, and it was going to be awesome, and I got the script, and I was really uh, disappointed to see what happened to all, most of the main characters. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, no, nobody was harmed in the process. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're they're giant robots. Yeah, no one was hurt. Um, I survived. <laughs> Bumblebee survived. Thank you. And we had a great, we had a great <laughs> death scene for you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, we can't fire the actor we like him, so let's just kill the character, you know. Actually, I kind of did that with a character later on. Uh, not his. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, anyway, so, and, and as you know, Bumblebee has very little to do in the, uh, in the film. I have like a few scenes at the top, and then I come in for the big dance number at the end. Um, so I, I, was, I was like, well, what's, you know, what's ha what happened to our show is kind of my, my question. And obviously, you know, the answer is they wanted to, to um, bring a new line into the uh, in, uh, new toy line. 86 in. product line. Yeah, exactly. So that's what they were clearing the shelves, basically. And they, they cleared them, man. They really cleared them. <laughs> Um, I do. Ha I have a question regarding this too, and I, maybe Flint can answer this because this has been asked to me a few times, and I don't have the answer. The little bit of profanity that the, <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. all true. That was yeah, never I, written in a script. That's what I want to know. I, you were there, right? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was this: was in those days, okay, there were four ratings for films. Actually, there was a brand new one, and and okay, there was G, PG, R, and X. Maybe MA came in. PG-13 was was created actually a couple of summers before. How many people know the answer to this question? What movie caused PG-13? Just say it out loud. Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. Yeah, very good. <laughs> that's and great. that's because they had the scene where the heart got pulled out, and that in the real world would have been an R movie, but you know Hollywood needed a hit that summer, and nobody wanted to honk off George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, and, Harrison Ford, <laughs> and so they created an entirely new rating for that. We wanted a PG. G was kind of death, like it is now. Okay, you know, when you see a movie rated G, you think, oh, that's really flaccid, you know, and you don't want to see it. Whereas, you know, now you want PG or probably sweet spots PG 13 for movies. You know, R is still, oddly enough, a little dangerous. I mean, Matrix crossed the line and became an R rated hit. But, and something else this summer did. did really Deadpool. 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 Yeah, Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah, Deadpool. Yeah. Great movie. Uh, but anyway, uh, sorry, what, what did I not answer? There's something there. It was, I want to know how that line got in there. Was it an Oh, yeah, it was. Okay, we have to put shit in there so that. So that you, <laughs> you, you will get a PG rating. Okay? Because, you know, I mean, you have to understand. I mean, it, it, tell me if this gets boring, but you know, just, just quick, kick me under the table. It's really right. tedious. But in, in the mid-1980s, there weren't animated movies, as I was saying. And... And you know the, there was no there was no model for this, and there's no way to overstate how disreputable writing and working in animation was at the time. I mean, you know, 
Children's Saturday morning was just disgraceful to the work in that, and syndication was only better, except there was a recession going on at that point. And we discovered, and that was my whole job on Transformers, we discovered that a lot of our audience was dads who were either home not working or people that came home early that would watch it. And that was the first period in human history when adults and kids could enjoy the same entertainment. My dad didn't sit down and watch Howdy Doody with me. Okay, you know, he just did it. And nor did it bother me. It wasn't that environment. Great dad, we did a lot of other fun stuff. We didn't do that. And, and all of a sudden, you know, now, there is no line between adult and kid entertainment. You know, I can sit around and play, you know, take your pick, Warcraft, League of Legends, you know, Civ, anything that's not too much Twitch, like my son did most of the Twitch in Uncharted 4. It's embarrassing because I worked on Uncharted 1, but, you know, <laughs> nevertheless, he was just faster than I. I mean, he's got the nervous system of a mongoose, and I don't. <laughs> but uh, but I mean, the point is we can all enjoy the same entertainment. That was this. We, that world was just being created back then. All right. Okay, but how did the word get in? <laughs> We're sitting in the recording, and and a joke call all of a sudden just sat him say, "Okay, say shit here." <laughs> so I'm sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. That was okay. Uh, that was the first I heard of it. I was just kind of sitting there, and I hear a character, you know, you know, say shit. It's like. That's not normal with children's fair. And, uh, and it, it was, it, it, I mean, if somebody had to explain it to me, I was having a slow day. I mean, I understood the world I was, in the you know, environment I was operating in. Okay, so, that, so it was specifically added so that you would get a PG So we would get a PG rating. Interesting. And Corey did not come up with it. No, it I, I, I do not believe, no, it, that's, that, that was a distributor's mandate, really. Wow. That would have okay. probably been the Scotty Brothers. Or, and once again, you know, Maybe Joe and Tom figured out. Somebody figured it out. But I mean, it was a business decision. It was not an artistic decision. And that one word. Yeah, we're, not it up. we're not putting shit in there because an actor wants to say shit. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you never know well, what that was going to do. That happened, you know, a different page. So that one word kicks it up from a from a G to a PG. To a PG. We were certain of getting a PG. I think the violence levels would have done it. Yeah. But they wanted no uncertainty. I don't even know they would have cried about it for a PG-13, but they definitely wanted a PG. And, 80s movies that were getting PGs in those days are a lot harsher than, you know, certainly than I remember them as being. I mean, you go back and rewatch Ghostbusters, I mean, there's some pretty, you know, raw stuff in there. They, yeah, I'd just forgotten all about it until I was doing the game, and I rewatched it, and I went, whoa, that was a family film? Uh, uh, so I'd say the same with Goonies, much harsher movie than I remember. Yeah, you know, just there's a whole, there, that whole era was tougher than you remember. And Flynn, how did you feel about the finished product? <coughs> well, uh, I mean, at that, I, mean I, you know, I had no objectivity whatsoever. You know, I, I've done 300,000 versions of the draft uh, of the script, and I've been in the recording sessions, and I got on the boards. Though I was not a really reliable board guy, but I did, I did do that. I was a producer, right? you know. Um, and you know, I, I, I think I'd seen a couple cuts of it before, before the final. And, you know, and by the time, I, I mean, my, my biggest reaction. I remember was, and I've had, what I'll say about that film that's interesting is every time I've seen it, I've only, probably only seen it five times since, you know, since I did it, was I remember my reaction the first night, well, when I went to the screening, there's this guy sitting behind me, since we're like, we've already crossed the line into harsh language here, and this, this guy sitting behind me, and the other side, shh, God, you know, I'm just hearing this, like, cursing, like, from somebody behind me here. And it was I, Wally Burr. I, 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 yeah, and, you know, I'm going, okay, fine, we didn't hit Citizen Kane, but it's not that bad. Okay, and I'm wondering, this is a cast and screw, crew screening, so this isn't, like, just some random guy up the street, right? And, uh, and, and, and I was kind of a little afraid. This guy was really upset. And this tells you everything you need to know about being in the movie business. And that is... Um, so I get up at the end, and you know, I kind of look over to see who the guy is, and the, and the guy sticks his hand out. He says, hey, Flint, we've never actually met, but I'm, and I can't remember the guy's name, but you know, I'm Scott, I was in, uh, you know, over at Paramount, I was a Dolby B guy, because we'd go in and listening to sweeping sessions, sweeping sessions of, of the movies. And that's the final pass on the sound, where you make sure the effects are all mixed right, and you hear it, but you're hearing it in a giant, you know, it, screening room at a, at a studio, and that was even for the TV shows, you're not hearing it in a real TV environment. But anyway, there are guys up in the booth, and I just tell them what I thought, you know, as if, you know, I felt kind of silly, I mean, these are professional sound guys, and I'm some goofball producer sitting there, but nevertheless, I would. And so the guy knew me very well, but I'd probably never actually seen him. 
And to him, the whole issue. So he says, did you hear the Dolby B? Did you hear the B track Dolby? And that thing, they, they screwed it up. They screwed up the transfer. It sounded like crap. Okay, to him, and this is all you need to know about the movie business or probably any other business. To him, that entire movie was the B track Dolby. Okay, to me, it's all the script. You know, and I'm not seeing a real movie. I'm sure Nelson was only seeing the colors and the animation and, and all that. I mean, it's, you know, that's what I saw. And it, I probably really didn't see the movie, uh, you know, objectively. I mean, I didn't watch it between then and when I did the commentary on the, on the 25th anniversary edition. Or was that 20th anniversary? Yeah, a, long a long time ago. A long time ago. 30's coming edition. up, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I just did the interview. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Put your teeth in. Would you? Yeah, I, I mean, you realize just, you know, like I, I, I was a kid when I was doing this stuff. Um, yeah, we all were kids. We had, yeah. like, I, I had like brown hair and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, what happened? So we're sitting there in the, uh, uh, you know, and then I watched it again the night before we did the, we did the, the audio track. And, and, and as, as I was saying, and then I'll, 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 stop, I'll stop talking, but it's kind of interesting, because you guys seem to be interested in this stuff, is when I saw it the first time, I, I was kind of relieved at how good it was. Then I saw it again when I was commenting on it, and I'm sitting there with Nelson and Sue Blue, and we're talking about it, and I'm realizing, wow, this really does wire together. And like, Nelson was explaining stuff that, to, in order to tell that story, there's such a complex set of, of visual and artistic decisions they had to make that I didn't even think about. Okay, I'm writing a script and it says Ashtray, you know, has this line on the script. And I don't think that I have to light Ashtray a certain way so you know he's a good guy and, you know, or the dipstick, you know, has to, you know, move a certain way. I'm not thinking about that, okay? And I realized how complex it was. Then I saw it over at Cine, at Cine Girl, right? Cine Girl is this bar where they screen movies. But I mean, it, this is in Hollywood and it's like a, basically a you know, imagine a professional screening room, but you know, with great sound and everything, but it's far. I'm watching that and the soundtrack's blaring into your comment about the soundtrack. If you want to feel, know what the 80s felt like, it is the Transformers soundtrack. That time I viewed it, I was 100% struck by the 80s-ness. And, and, and I don't know, anybody actually lived during the 80s? We want the 80s yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> The 80s as well. Yeah, and then I was sitting there. Well, I, I'll do one last thing. I'll show it. And then I was sitting there at at uh, the Egyptian theater. They did a screening of it, and I was doing it as you know as, as kind of a thing. But we, I'm also working on a game called Ingress, uh, as I do is is um, real world games now. And uh, so we had like Ingress fans show up for it, and. Uh, as well as Transformer people, and I was just kind of crossing over the two. And, you know, and um, I was watching it, I was struck by a sense, and I was sitting there with a guy who was writing a graphic novel with the time, a guy named Chris Benson, who's a uh, uh, creative uh, head at Blizzard. And, and we're sitting there watching it, and I'm, and I'm watching this film, and I'm thinking, this feels like an art film. I'm looking at this elaborate stuff when when you know, Unicron's opening up, and you know, at this point, I'm almost like personally utterly divorced from it. I'm actually just seeing a film, and, I, and it was striking me: this, this is like an art film. So, point is, when you see a film a lot of time over a lot of decades, you it, it is a different experience every time that you encounter it. That's Thank you. Thanks. Anyway, Frank Frank does a thing where he does feedback like perfectly. Per you know, when when the, when the microphone feeds back on itself. And you get that high pitched squeal. Frank does that so that you can't tell the difference between him and the thing. And he would start doing it in the middle of a session, and the engineer was absolutely insane. No, be in there. He's looking. He's, this jack has got to be loose. Hang on, Wally. Hang on one second. And Frank is doing the thing. And the beautiful thing about Frank is he's like, Frank is looking around too, like this. He, he doesn't know where he. I mean, yeah, it was. That uh, was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, there was a constant. Oh, they were always giving those guys. And then you know, Peter's trying to make Frank laugh. Uh, Michael Bell's trying to make everybody laugh. I mean, it was. And, oh, we and, haven't even gotten to Chris Latta. Oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Chris Latta sweat like nobody I ever saw. Yeah, he had like a permanent flop sweat. He had sweat, and 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 God rest his soul, he was incredibly. Beautiful human being and a wonderful, unbelievably talented, talented, very talented. I, no, I mean it's yeah. I mean I get I, yeah. I get to do this book. I just yeah. Chris Lotter because I was always having to like 
pick them up out of jail from the studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get them in a recording yeah. session. I talk a little about that. Yeah. Yeah. About Chris I mean, was, in the book. Uh, I mean, I never actually found out what I was. It was always fifteen hundred dollars, and I never. <laughs> no, nobody ever told me what it was for. I mean, I mean, you know, it's like I would get. You know, yeah. those guys like you know serial killer. You might want to tell me because I'm driving them home. You know, but, <laughs> You know, it's always fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, he he was apparently he, was, he paid me it all back later on. He did. Yeah. He was an honorable man. He was, oh, he, he was an extraordinary character. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I mean, and if you had to find a sound nobody else's show had, it was the insanity because that is the guy. Yeah. Uh, of. Uh, of, uh, you know, like Cobra Commander. Well, I mean, his star scream, there's, yeah. I mean, I, I mean where does character. that come from? I mean, that's, yeah. that's just crazy. Yeah. It's so perfect for the character. So perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. So the sessions, and, and Flint knows too, because he was on the other side of the glass trying to probably... Find yeah, I mean, any situation in which I'm the adult supervision, <laughs> <laughs> you can only imagine what it is. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it was pretty wild back in the day. Because Wally was just kind of, Wally was getting a little hard of hearing at that point, so he didn't hear a lot of this carnage. Yes, Wally was in his 80s at the time, so... Yeah. No, he wasn't. Um, but he was anyway, well in his 60s. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, but he managed to write very well. Yeah, well, he wasn't young like we were, right, Lynn? No, <laughs> yeah, we were babies. Yeah, we I mean, were I was just out of film school. I know. I was just out of the womb. <laughs> When I was putting this book together, I, I wanted photographs to put in the book, and I found a few. There are, I don't know that there are any pictures existing of that time of us no. in the booth. I, I had one of Frank and me at the microphone. I was able to pull that from a frame from a documentary they had made. And I asked Wally, I asked a lot of the cast members, I said, does anybody have any pictures? And Wally said, I think Okay, that this is really an 80s singing duo that he stuck a picture in. It is not. <laughs> Um, oh, you got a shot of Wally's. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Where, we had, where it actually took place. Uh, you know, I went in there like uh, uh, probably I'd say 1990. Yeah. yeah, you know, I was doing a game recording, a video game recording in there, and it was still like a shrine to us. In the, you know, <laughs> no, it was, uh, maybe about 2000. I mean, it was wow. shockingly long afterwards. Wow. And there's still the My Little Girl, the My Little Pony yeah. poster, yeah. the yeah. GI Joe. Yeah. Yeah. I still have those things. Yeah, a lot of history in that building. A yeah. Lot of history. Oh yeah, that outrageous stuff. Happened. Here's here's a quick story. Uh, you were still allowed to smoke, believe it or not, at the time, in the studio while you were recording. This is how long ago it was. And at one point... Well, that's why it was so good, too. Yeah, true. <laughs> well, you know we were smoking, for one thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> not calm out. Um, somebody took a lit cigarette and threw it into a trash can. And there was a lot of paper in the trash can. Yes, you guessed it. It's, it started... They're, they're, an actual fire started. Everybody was so involved in the show, nobody noticed it until smoke started to fill the room. <laughs> And finally, you know, it's like, excuse me, Wally, there's a fire in here. <laughs> no, I think the screams we used them in the show, right? Yeah, exactly. It was great wall up, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> I was badly burned. You want to see? <laughs> Maybe not. Anyway, suffice it to say, crazy time. Uh, it was. It was. Yeah. What was the origin of the Isle of Monka Spanka? <laughs> Was, was that you, Flynn? <laughs> I have no idea where that might have come from. Okay, just I know just, of no such character uh, or, or problem. But just asking. Just asking. Not be disposed to discuss it. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was from Visionary, wasn't it? What? No, was no, no, that's from our show. Oh, okay, Marcus Panka, yeah. It was the island of Marcus Panka. Uh, I mean, so you thought we were spanking the mic in that episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's a wonderful quality about your voice acting. When I hear Bumblebee, yeah. Peter Parker, I just keep thinking, I wish I had a friend like that. There's something about you where I, I always, I told my friends, I consider you like the most charismatic, one of the most charismatic figures I know. Were you always like that and were you popular in high school? <laughs> just one. Yes. <laughs> Bumblebee's the heart of the show, you know. I mean, I mean, just think about it that way. You know, well, it was the, it was the link to it was the link to you guys yeah. as as kids because he was Spike's friend. So and Spike was you guys, yeah. as far as I, I, that's how I saw it at least. Spike was you guys, and his relationship with Spike was his relationship with you. So that was that was the real link. Yeah, he's the heart of the characters of the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, question for Dan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what was the biggest WTF moment from Transformers? The biggest what kind of moment? WTF moment from the cartoon. I, it was really the movie for me. When I when I when I saw the movie script, I thought, "What the hell are they doing?" 
Seriously, you know, the same thing yeah, ever, right? well, kids are gonna kids from coast to coast are gonna be traumatized by this. <laughs> and am I wrong? Am I wrong? I mean, some of you were probably what three, four, five, six years old seeing this thing. Optimus dead. Uh, Ironhide dead. Uh, I forget. Everybody's dead. <laughs> They're all dead, go home, good night, you know? It, it's lightning round, but I mean, we did have, the, there was a scene in the in the version of the Transformer movie Jay and I wrote that was totally ill-advised, where we took the entire 85, every character is discontinued, we put them in charge of the light brigade, and we just slaughtered them. <laughs> <laughs> in one charge. You know what? He's smiling, there's a certain amount of pain. I'm certain about my idiot here. I would still look at this. They were all traumatized in 85, but they're here now. Yeah. <laughs> and the decision was made in the 1986 movie to start basically clean slate, wipe out so many different characters. Was it, was the decision to eliminate certain characters based on their character importance to the story, or was it because they just didn't sell enough toys? No, nobody cared about the story. It, it was, they, they felt they had exhausted the, I mean, that's the, the, the other side of the creative control. They just, they were in the business of selling toys. From the perspective of Hasbro, our shows were 22 minute commercials. And they thought it was really funny, hey, Mattel's got to advertise in the middle of our commercial. Okay, that, that was the level in which they were thinking. And, 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 and they, they, they felt that these characters had exhausted their story cycle. But remember, we didn't know that we had already created a core of characters that people 30 years later were gonna be remembering. We just, we, were, we created these things, we started, we couldn't miss, and it's like, all right, lose the semi and in with the hot rod. Well, you know, done, you know, and that's how it was. It's kill Bumblebee just because it's the voice actor. But, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I mean, but it, you know, it, was, it was bringing a new product line, which, by the way, is the final answer to season three, and that was the nature of the products. Because you remember season three products were pretty abstract. I mean, triple changer. We used to joke, this is a huh, it turns into a what? <laughs> you know, because they didn't look like anything. It's a far cry from blaster. You know? Awesome, thanks, guys. Okay. Probably the most fun and easiest one to write was Starscream because he's just such a tech treasure to swine. Yeah, I mean, if I did, but I mean, you know, there, it, I'd say it matches up with the core characters. I mean, it's you know, Bumblebee, Optimus, Megatron, Starscream. You know, um, and I and I like some of the G1 characters. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Now we'll really leave. Yeah. All right. We'll go. Big hand for our